Hello, and thank you for joining us for our event today, Taking on the Toughest Fights Globally. I'm Yolanda Richardson, Executive Vice President with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. We are celebrating our 25th anniversary fighting tobacco here in the United States and abroad. This is the second installment of our 25th anniversary storytelling series, highlighting how we're taking on the toughest fights around the world. Today, you will hear from incredible leaders who have been instrumental, indeed critical, to the success of their countries in reducing tobacco consumption. We are pleased to highlight five countries that have passed effective laws and policies despite an ever vigilant industry focus on, focused on evading regulation. Brazil is a global leader in tobacco control, successfully cutting tobacco consumption by half, even as it remains a major producer of tobacco leaf in the world. In India, local and state governments are particularly working hard to combat the use of smokeless tobacco which has been responsible for India's disproportionately high rates of oral cancer. Effective passage of laws and policies in Bangladesh, Philippines, and Ukraine have also resulted in significant declines. Each country can boast that their efforts have led to double digit relative declines in prevalence. With support from Bloomberg Philanthropies, we are pleased to work with these leaders and through our support helped to prevent millions of premature deaths over the past 15 years. Now, I'd like to officially start our program by sharing a message from Dr. Vera Luisa da Costa e Silva. Dr. Costa e Silva is former head of the FCT Secretariat and a visiting professor at Vera Cruz in Brazil. She'll tell us more about the incredible work happening in Brazil to reduce tobacco use. Happy anniversary, CTFK. Tobacco continues to be the leading cause of preventable death in the world, killing annually more than 8 million uh, people and uh, uh, generating costs of more than $1.4 trillion in healthcare expenses and other economic losses. Meanwhile, the tobacco industry continues to look uh, for new markets to get opportunities to sell its deadly tobacco and nicotine products, uh, especially in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And we know what works against uh, tobacco use. We know what can uh, save lives. It's all about increasing taxes and prices of tobacco products uh, including pictorial health warnings and cigarette packs. It's about uh, uh, banning uh, tobacco advertised promotion, advertisement promotion and sponsorship, and making public places smoke-free, among other measures. This is all embedded in the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, a public health treaty that saves lives. And uh, um, governments, uh, know that using this evidence-based uh, tool is essential in curbing the tobacco epidemic. It's just an issue of political will. It's just an issue of moving public health agenda forward by using evidence-based tobacco control measures. When I was the head of the Convention Secretariat, I have witnessed many governments moving the tobacco control agenda forward and saving lives ultimately. And uh, I had the pleasure to see my own country, Brazil, um, and to also participate in the story of tobacco control in Brazil, uh, a very successful uh, tobacco control story. Brazil has reduced in 14 years uh, the prevalence of tobacco use by 37.6%. And this was due to a number of uh, evidence measures that Brazil has put into place through legislative and regulatory uh, measures. One was um, increasing uh, tobacco taxes and prices, having a specific uh, policy for it from 2012 onwards, banning tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship in 2001 and completing it in 2011 banning it in, on point of sales, 
um, making it mandatory pictorial health warnings in cigarette packs, banning electronic nicotine uh, delivery systems and heated tobacco products in the country. And um, this was all packed uh, uh, into a, a successful uh, story. And uh, um, this was uh, this had as a as a as a baseline uh, element the establishment of a national commission, a multi-sectoral commission that um, speaks with one voice, international and internally, um, was due to the fact that Brazil has created a regulatory agency that regulates the tobacco industry and regulates tobacco products, and that Brazil has a network of civil society and academia organizations that has put into place an advocacy component taking a strong stand against the tobacco industry uh, interference. And uh, of course, we had a strong support from international organizations and one successful case story is the support received by the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. The Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids has provided financial and technical support to Brazil, has uh, supported the country uh, when the, there were files from the tobacco industry against uh, strong legislation and has also uh, supported Brazil in uh, putting forward uh, a, a case to receive back healthcare costs generated by tobacco use. This is here Brazil, campaign for tobacco free kids here, a successful story. Long life to you CTFK. Happy 25th anniversary. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Costa Silva. Tobacco control progress in Brazil has been inspiring and we thank you for your ongoing leadership. Now, I'm pleased to introduce for our key note remarks today, the Honorable Minister Hirsch Verdon. Dr. Verdon is a longstanding and passionate champion of tobacco control. During his tenure as minister, he successfully introduced graphic health warnings covering 85% of packs in tobacco control, catapulting and positioning India as a global leader in tobacco control. And this year, he received the WHO Director General Special Recognition Award for his invaluable and ongoing leadership. I'm grateful to have been invited to join you today on the proud occasion of the 25th anniversary of Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. I would like to express my immense appreciation for the numerous achievements attained over the years under the EGs of this organization. Friends, it gives me great pleasure to share that as India moves towards 75 years of independence, there has been remarkable progress in the health status of its population. Our efforts in India to curtail tobacco use are aimed at reaching our entire population of 1.3 billion to make each segment aware of its ill effects and associated risks. In the last seven years, the strong political will and concerted targeted action by my government has contributed to substantial achievements in tobacco control measures like the displaying large warnings covering 85% of area on packs of tobacco products, introduction of a dedicated helpline for assisting people to quit tobacco, combating the menace of e-cigarettes through a statute on prohibition of electronic cigarettes and like devices, regulation of display and use of tobacco products, in films and television programs are among the various steps we have been taking to generate awareness and advance tobacco control. Friends, tobacco control needs to be pursued like a mission, a social movement and a noble cause, a cause with which we can live, identify and do something worthwhile for humankind. Let us remember that in our fight for tobacco control, we have a moral high ground since we are on a path of righteousness. We in society can contribute a lot towards discouraging tobacco use among youth. 
Schools can raise awareness of the dangers of initiating nicotine and tobacco use by providing information resources and making their campuses tobacco and ends free. Youth groups can organize local events to engage and educate young people on the many harms of tobacco use, including its impact on personal finances. Film, television, and drama production companies can pledge to no longer depict tobacco or e-cigarette use. Celebrities and social influencers can reject offers of brand ambassadorship and refuse sponsorship by nicotine and tobacco industries. There is too much pain in seeing young people die at an early age due to prolonged tobacco use. I wish to see an outcry. Let there be rage. Let there be anger against any attempts to dilute or weaken the tobacco control efforts, policy or law. I have no doubt in my mind that together we can win this battle and make a historic difference. For this, we need to play our role with the highest sense and call of duty. Let us today resolve to do this, to attain the goal of a tobacco free and a healthy world. I assure you that India is making its best efforts to play its role and take the tobacco control leadership forward. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this momentous occasion. I wish you all great success in all your endeavors dedicated towards the cause of tobacco control. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Your call to arms is an inspiration to us all. Now I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, a distinguished member of parliament in Bangladesh, Dr. Saber Chowdhury. Mr. Chowdhury is an also honorary president of the Inter-Parliamentarian Union. He brought together South Asian parliamentary speakers to raise and elevate the importance of tobacco control in the region. He also played an important role in passing national tobacco control legislation in Bangladesh, which among other things sought to comprehensively ban smoking in all places. Tell us more about your efforts in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here and uh, to be part of the discussions and the celebrations. I think it's not just a celebration of uh, 25 years of campaign for tobacco free kids. Uh, we are also, uh, in many respects, uh, celebrating uh, solidarity, uh, partnership, uh, teamwork, and working together. Uh, because I have seen the value of this partnership and how it has uh, inspired us. You know, when you are fighting a tough battle, uh, it's good to know that there are others around the world who are engaged in a similar battle. And I think uh, what Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids has done is to inspire us with examples from around the world. Uh, so you know that you're not alone uh, in this fight. Um, so Bangladesh, as you know, is, uh, is a very populous country. and uh, Unfortunately, uh, tobacco has had a very established presence uh, for, uh, for many years. Uh, there are a number of multinational companies who are working here. So after Bangladesh signed the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in 2003, and I believe we were one of the first countries, uh, within two years, we drafted our first legislation in 2005. And to give you an idea as to how seriously the government has taken the entire issue of public health and saving lives, uh, within six years, we actually had an amendment to the law. I think that in itself was a great achievement because normally when a law is enacted in parliament, uh, it sits there for maybe 15, 20 years before we uh, look at a review. And uh, the important elements that were introduced in this, uh, this revised law, uh, one was the definition of tobacco, you know, something very basic. Uh, the Honorable Minister for Health in India uh, talked about uh, smokeless tobacco, and that is also a problem in Bangladesh. So it wasn't just cigarettes. We also uh, um, included uh, smoke test tobacco uh, within the framework of that definition. Uh, we also extended uh, the definition of public places. Um, we also introduced uh, graphic warnings in this new legislation. So there's been a lot of work there. 
And I think one of the most important events that we organized was the one that you alluded to when we had the speakers of parliament from South Asia uh, in Dhaka, uh, along with the IPU and hosted by the Bangladesh parliament where our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina actually made a tremendously courageous statement. Uh, she committed to making Bangladesh smoke free um, by the year 2040. So, you know, we talk about political will and political engagement and political buy-in. So when you have the highest level of government actually committing uh, a deadline and saying that Bangladesh is going to be tobacco free by 2040, that was a huge step. And following on from that, you know, when it comes to work in the parliament, uh, in the budget, we have introduced a, a development health charge on all tobacco sales. So there are proceeds being generated and we are looking to see how those proceeds can be used to rehabilitate people who are working in the tobacco industry. Um, and there's a lot of other work that's going on. So I think Bangladesh uh, has been a success story in terms of reducing the, the rate of prevalence, you know, when it comes to adult tobacco uh, usage. Uh, but the, the fight goes on because it's not an easy fight. And uh, this is a very strong lobby that we are fighting against. And when we got into the fight, uh, we knew perfectly well that it was going to be a marathon rather than a 100 meter sprint. So we are prepared for that marathon. You know, we are absolutely committed to the cause. And I think as we go forward, there is a post campaign for tobacco free kids. There are other organizations in Bangladesh, such as the Bangladesh Heart Foundation, Bangladesh Cancer Society. Um, there is a civil society in an initiative called Bogda. We have been able to get the media organized. You know, they have their own group of reporters uh, who are uh, covering uh, news and stories on, on tobacco control, raising awareness. There is work at the constituency level, especially among schools and trying to uh, talk to them about uh, tobacco usage. We are also trying to make people more aware of the impacts of secondhand smoking. Um, so I think it has Bangladesh, there has been a lot of activity, but we know that there is still a very long way to go. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chaudhry. Um, you're right, it was at the meeting of South Asian um, uh, parliamentary speakers that the prime minister made that commitment. Um, and so I guess what I'd like to, to ask is, how, what do you think are the remaining challenges in meeting that um, very ambitious target? Well, you know, I think uh, the way the Ministry of Finance looks at tobacco, I think is, is very important because, you know, the Ministry of Finance is always looking at revenues and trying to balance that by also looking at the cost of public health. So, you know, we have actually done the calculations. Uh, how much does it cost the Bangladesh economy in terms of healthcare? in terms of loss of productivity and what is the revenue you're generating from taxing tobacco. Uh, so, you know, we are still in that fight. There's a budget uh, that has not been placed. I have introduced legislation that actually removes tobacco from the list of essential commodities. Uh, can you believe it? I mean, this is legislation that goes back to the early 50s, uh, which talks of tobacco as being an essential commodity. Uh, so we are also doing that work. You know, I think we also need to simplify the tax structure. We need to go more on specific taxes. Uh, it's important to raise taxes, but not um, in a manner that actually increases, uh, increases or makes the bottom line of the tobacco companies even better. So how can we have specific taxes and how can the government collect those? And then I think there is also the uh, very major challenge of looking at the, at the uh, supply side. You know, we tend to focus on the demand side of tobacco, you know, by introducing taxes, by fiscal initiatives. But I think we also have to look at the supply side. And we are trying to connect the dots in terms of the uh, effects on public health, uh, on deforestation, you know, and all of the other uh, issues and factors that come into play. Um, so I think that's uh, still work in progress. As I say, we have a long way to go. We are also trying to have a roadmap in place uh, that is going to uh, take us to where we want to be in 2040. So we are trying to work backwards and what needs to be done to achieve that. The last thing we want is to be in 2025 and realize that we have five years to make that goal a reality. So I think there is a lot of activity and I certainly see campaign for tobacco free kids and also the other great organizations who are working us, supporting us, inspiring us, uh, you know, giving us data, presenting, it, uh, presenting us with research, best practices, so that the advocacy can be taken to a whole new level. You, you mentioned the, the health levy, and I think it holds a lot of promise for, for Bangladesh. How do you believe it's most effectively used in educating the public and keeping them 
um, committed to um, the needs for additional regulation? I think the communication and in the, this uh, age of uh, social media, you know, how can we leverage social media? How can we reach young people uh, in a way that they can relate to? I think that's important. But what we are trying to do first and foremost with the development surcharge is that we are trying to rehabilitate individuals who are already working in this industry. You know, and this is something also that the tobacco lobby does. They grossly inflate the figures uh, in terms of numbers of people who are actually working in this sector. Uh, we have uh, done the studies, we know it's uh, 40, 45,000 people. So I think first we need to take care of that uh, and then have you know other outreach efforts. Um, we have already been very severe when it comes to advertising by tobacco uh, companies. Uh, we have tried to make sure that they don't try to have ambush marketing, you know, use CSR and other things. So I think rehabilitation of the existing uh, workforce that is engaged in tobacco, I think that's important. And then the education, of course, is also a very important part. Thank you so much for your comments. We are looking forward to hearing more about what's happening in Bangladesh during the Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, now, I'd like to just turn our attention to Philippines. Senator Paya Cayetano, from the Philippines had planned to join us today to discuss the progress in Philippines in advancing tobacco control, including the passage of a substantial tax on tobacco products, the revenues of which supported expansion of healthcare services in Philippines. Due to an unexpected commitment, it prevented her from joining us today, but she does in fact sense her regrets. Tobacco control in Philippines has benefited from an active and engaged civil society. Jonathan Malaya, under Secretary, Department of Interior and Local Government in Philippines describes vital civil society groups like our partner organization, Health Justice, in enhancing and supporting government efforts. His remarks are next. Uh, civil society organizations play a very instrumental and significant role. Um, the DILG really has a lot on its plate. No? We have a lot of functions, we have a lot of mandates, and we simply do not have the manpower and the time to focus on all pressing problems of the country. No? So the work we do with civil society organizations is very crucial because they allow us, they, they, allow, they give us technical assistance, uh, they give us um, the opportunity to focus on some areas which um, normally we would not have taken up. No? Uh, for example, here in the uh, smoke-free campaign, the work of health justice has, has been very instrumental, uh, providing for technical assistance, providing for uh, technical working groups, uh, providing for uh, focus group discussions. And all of these activities are very important because they inform decision-making. As a result of our collaboration with civil society organizations, we're able to come out with informed policies, no? policies that are based on studies, policies that are based on facts. No? And that kind of policies are much, much easier to implement on the ground. Because if a policy is discussed uh, with stakeholders, then um, the greater uh, chances of success are higher uh, when we start implementing implementing the policy. Thank you for those remarks. Um, as evidenced by today's um, conversations with government leaders from around the world, we understand how important it is for them to champion tobacco control and to work effectively with civil society to engage the public and other policymakers. In our next panel, we will hear from civil society champions who have worked tirelessly to advocate for effective policies in their countries. I'm joined today by two outstanding advocates, Dr. Pankaj Shakavari, a cancer surgeon based at um, Mumbai's Tata Memorial Hospital in India, and Lilia Olafur, Executive Director of Life Advocacy Center in Ukraine. Dr. Shakavari, let's start with you. You were the 2013 winner of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids Judy Wilkenfield Award, and we're honored for the work that you've done in India specifically with the Voice of Victims campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about your work at that time? So thank you, Yolanda, for uh, reminding me of uh, that award because that was truly an inspiration for me. And also 
uh, in the tough world of tobacco control, such recognitions and honors keep you going. Uh, moreover, that honor was for many tobacco victims uh, who lost their lives. While losing their life, they made a purpose for their life and saved the lives of others. And let me explain this. Uh, tobacco industry being very powerful, uh, statistics is one thing to counter them. You go to policymakers, you go to the politicians, you go to law enforcers and tell them about the statistics of uh, death, disaster and uh, despair that is unleashed by tobacco industry. But the statistics really don't uh, move their heart. But if you have a tobacco victim, even a single cancer patient, who has gone through that whole uh, devastation caused by tobacco, the story and the story of how at young age they got mouth cancer, at young age they got their throat and mouth and jaw removed, how they were rendered disabled, how their families are suffering, how the children are suffering, how their parents are suffering, and how this is a huge financial crisis that has been now uh, getting into their life. So these stories are so moving that even the stone-hearted people would become converted and they will engage into tobacco control. And for me, the most powerful advocate for tobacco control are not the doctors, but a young woman who lost her husband because of tobacco, a young child who lost the parents because of tobacco, and both of them did not make a personal choice of using tobacco. And that is how nearly 600 uh, tobacco victims, mainly cancer patients, they became the public face and they brought down the shutter on the very industry that sold them cancer. Thank you, Dr. Shadaway. That is incredibly moving and I completely agree with the importance of really putting a human face on tobacco control. Lilia, let's hear from you. What are the kinds of things that you did on the ground in Ukraine to help advance tobacco control. Thank you, Yolanda. Since 2008, when CTFK and LIFE started working in Ukraine, the lives of millions of Ukrainians have changed dramatically. Families can enjoy smoke-free environment. They can have their meal in smoke-free restaurants. There is no direct advertising. And so many more things changed in Ukraine. In 2008, the taxes on tobacco were increased significantly for the first time. In 2012, the bills on banning smoking indoor, banning tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship were adopted. And the pictorial health warnings covering 50% of the pack were finally introduced. This policy changes resulted in decrease of daily smoking prevalence from 25 to 20% among adults in Ukraine. Since 2014, Ukrainian government increases taxes annually on tobacco products. Moreover, from 2018, Ukrainian uh, government implemented the seven-year plan that increases the specific excise on cigarettes and other tobacco products by at least 20% every year till 2025. But still, we have to remember that tobacco kills more than 85,000 of Ukrainians annually. This is more than AIDS, alcohol, car accidents, illegal drugs, murders, and suicides combined. Despite enormous progress in tobacco consumption reduction over the last few years, smoking is still the leading cause of preventable deaths in Ukraine. Therefore, in 2021, Ukrainian government increased taxes by fourfold on heated tobacco products in order to harmonize tax rates on heated tobacco products with tax duties on cigarettes in line with the seven year plan and also increase taxes on uh, electronic cigarettes. On June 1st uh, this year, the next day after the World No Tobacco Day, the Parliament of Ukraine adopted the comprehensive bill 4358 in the first reading. 339 members of Ukrainian parliament from all parliament fractions, the constitutional majority of the parliament voted for the bill 4358. Right now, Ukrainian members of the parliament are working to pass the bill in the second reading in autumn 2021. Advocacy Center Life, together with Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, are working with Ukrainian policy champions, decision makers, and media to help champion the comprehensive bill. 
Thank you, Lillian. Congratulations. Um, it shows that we have to continue to move forward. Dr. Pankaj, I want to turn back to you because you were such a formidable um, champion of tobacco control and you continue to be. What are the present day challenges that you feel are facing India with respect to tobacco control? So we know that every almost 95% of Indians know as per the global adult tobacco survey that tobacco is harmful. So we are dealing with a product which is evidently harmful, inherently harmful, known to everyone in the society that it is harmful. Then why are we still discussing about tobacco control, not tobacco eradication? The reason is that this is the only health hazard for which there is a very powerful industry which is promoting it. And just like the COVID virus, how it is mutating to survive, tobacco industry keeps mutating to survive all these efforts that we as tobacco control uh, advocates and uh, groups try to do it. Now the present day challenge or the always the challenge would remain that this is one product which has nicotine, which is very highly addictive, this is much more addictive than uh, even uh, you know heroin and all those classified drugs. And therefore, the tobacco industry is able to recruit new customers, new users, despite pack warning, despite all kinds of information that we are giving through television, through social media, through cinema halls. That is for me is a challenge that how do we prevent the youth initiation in a country where only 3% of tobacco users are able to quit tobacco. And we formulated a strategy that what lures our youth into addiction, what kind of addiction, part of uh, addiction is smokeless tobacco, smoking, all kinds of things. And we worked on a strategy which was tailor-made to reduce youth initiation and that was ban on flavored smokeless tobacco that we call gutka. You know, both of you are talking about the immense progress that's happened in your country and the continued challenges. Both countries have seen, you know, um, substantial declines in prevalence. And so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to highlight the work here. Undergirding that has been the role of civil society. You both have worked outside of government to make change happen. Can you talk a little bit about what you believe the role of civil society to be and how CTFK specifically, but other international groups can support your work? I'll start with you, Lilia. I think that um, for our team and for everybody else who has supported us on this long way, and there were so many people, civil society organizations, experts, who were so supportive, no matter what, and knowing this, knowing that we are not alone, uh, helped us a lot through all of the challenges because um, Sometimes governments are not as responsive as we would like them to be. Sometimes some changes taking long and uh, longer. There are always some obstacles, but at the same time, we know that um, people support what we do. We know that 87% of Ukrainians want to have stronger tobacco control legislation because they want their kids to be protected from tobacco. Moreover, we know that uh, unfortunately 50% of young people in Ukraine from 18 to 30 years old, they do think that uh, heated tobacco products are, are less harmful. So we see and we've done a lot of work, but there are so many more challenges ahead of us. I wish we knew in advance about the, the challenges that are coming, that we could ban all those novel products beforehand. But staying uh, persistent and uh, always finding hope and always knowing that um, that's what people want. We are there to speak on their behalf because young people, kids, they cannot be there talking to decision makers every day. So it's our job to make sure that those people who cannot be heard can be heard and to be their voice uh, and uh, to have Ukraine um, to implement all of the provisions of the FCTC and become one of the uh, most achieving countries in the world. I think this is one of the dreams that uh, Life Team has. Thank you, Lilia. 
Pankaj, I'm going to end with you. You know, you guys have talked about, um, you know, the being in a fight against a formidable uh, opponent like the tobacco industry. And more recently, we've had, India's had the challenge of COVID. Can you talk about like what inspires you to keep going through all of it um, and uh, uh, and tell us more about how you think civil society can continue to support you. Perfect. So I'll just step back and say one more thing on the previous question mm -hmm. that I keep telling everyone that tobacco is a health issue, but tobacco control is a political issue. Mm -hmm. Unless every tobacco control advocate understands this, that do not approach tobacco control as a health issue, then only we are going to succeed. And the basis of Voice of Tobacco Victims campaign was that we converted the entire health issue into a political issue because we are talking about 1 million deaths in India. We are talking about 40% of cancers being attributable to tobacco in India. We are talking about one of the etiologies, which is the commonest cause of uh, death in the youth. And we are talking about 4,000 deaths every day. When you talk, then immediately the health issue becomes secondary. What comes prominent is a child rights issue because children are getting in, uh, orphaned. Women's right issue because women are getting widowed. Then there are environmental issues, which are because of the deforestation and the secondhand smoke and everything. There are labor issues because BD workers are work working in all those uh, difficult circumstances. So basically, what we realize that unless you approach from non-health ways, the politicians are not going to be very willing to listen to you. Now, the next question that you asked me about what keeps us going despite the difficulty is because I'm a cancer surgeon. In my OPD, I see young people die every day. I see young people suffer, leave behind their bereaved parents and bereaved family with you know, all kinds of sorrows every day. I'm seeing the families getting destroyed every day. So the only option I have to remain silent or raise the voice. Now, raising the voice as a doctor, we have been able to motivate around 400 and 500 doctors who are becoming very strong advocates. The beauty of Tata Hospital Alumni is that we are top cancer surgeons. And for us, all the doors are open for advocacy because we have no conflict of interest. We are not working for profession as in uh, tobacco control. We are in fact working against our profession. We want to reduce the burden of uh, cancer. We want to reduce the burden of disease. And that is how by mere advocacy, we have been able to move the states. We have been able to move the center. And that is how tobacco control has been accelerated. And that is where CTFK, I must say that, uh, we are not the specialist for tobacco control. I'm a surgeon. My 80 to 90 percent goes in surgery. But this entire effort was coordinated in such a beautiful way by CTFK. All the international best practices, all the documentation, all the research work, all the logistics, all the coordination work was done by the CTFK so that the work of the doctors and advocates was limited for few minutes and few hours. Thank you so much. This has been really wonderful for you to join us to talk about what's happening in your respective countries. Thank you, Dr. Panka Chakavedi. Thank you, uh, Lilia Olifer. Um, we'll be able to talk with them again during the, the live Q&A and a little uh, later in our presentation. Thank you again. Looking forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids is really honored to have worked in each of these countries um, that we've discussed today. But the work wouldn't be possible without the support of Bloomberg Philanthropies. I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Kelly Henning, Public Health Program Lead for Bloomberg Philanthropies, to talk about the organization's investment in tobacco control. Dr. Henning, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Yolanda. It's great to be here. So how about you start off telling us a little bit about why Michael Bloomberg, and specifically Bloomberg Philanthropies, focus its philanthropy on global tobacco control. Bloomberg Philanthropies has been very focused on leading causes of death. What are those things out there? What are those health conditions that we could have impact on um, that have very large burden? And tobacco really comes in at number one. 
There's no question that we should all everywhere in public health be working on tobacco control, no matter what our specialty or what our area of interest, because it's the leading cause agent of death around the world. And I think when we looked at that, it was very clear that this is where we should focus efforts. Um, the other aspect is that when Mike Bloomberg was mayor in New York City, he took up tobacco control for the city of New York, and it was not a very popular fight in the, in the beginning. It was a quite difficult one, um, but one that he felt really passionate about and stuck with it and really saw great results. And so I think we, we saw that it was possible and we wanted to be able to support uh, groups around the world to do this extremely important work. The foundation has made a real commitment. Um, we're now in year 15 of the Bloomberg Initiative to reduce tobacco use. Um, can you share with us a little bit about how you track and measure progress? Yeah, so a lot of the public health team at Bloomberg uh, are public health um, professionals and epidemiologists. So we care a lot about the data. And when we set up the Bloomberg Initiative, um, we set up a couple of different tracking mechanisms. Um, things like support to the World Health Organization to understand um, policy change in each country around the world and how, how progress was being made at the policy level. Also support to WHO and CDC um, and CDC Foundation to track actual um, prevalence. Uh, so things through, the, this is mostly through, the, uh, through GATS, through the Glo Global Adult Tobacco Survey, and also some of the youth surveys. Um, and I think, you know, these have been measures that have been extremely important, but we also track live saved. So we have done a number of modeling studies to look at how many lives have been saved through those policies that the countries have worked so hard to pass and get in place. And in the countries where we work currently, we, we estimate about 35 million lives have been saved and that number is being updated right now. And I hope it's going to increase greatly. Kelly, you mentioned that um, when, um... Uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, was supporting tobacco control or advancing tobacco control in New York City, that it was not easy. Can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that um, the initiative has faced over these past 15 years? Yolanda, I think we've learned so much from our colleagues at the country level. There have been so many challenges that um, that governments and uh, and advocacy groups have 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 experienced, and we've learned a lot from from those experiences. Certainly we've learned that it's very hard to pass tax, tax uh, increases, that even though that is clearly the most effective way to reduce tobacco use, it's also a very challenging and difficult policy um, to get in place. And we've also learned that the tobacco industry is very um, flexible, very wily, uh, really, really very innovative and that we have to be that way as well through support to those on the ground to know how best to fight back. Um, I think what we're seeing now is the industry sort of turning themselves into the, um, the you know, with the positive image, really trying to pr promote the idea that they're for health and that we're crazy tobacco control people and they're the smart people. And we've really got to overcome that idea and we really have to push back against the idea that the tobacco industry is the solution because it's quite clear that they are not the solution. Thank you for that. Kelly, I'd be remiss given that this is our 25th anniversary um, event without giving you the opportunity to talk about the role that the campaign has been playing in the initiative and what you think has been most critical about CTFK's in involvement in the initiative. Yolanda, I really wanna congratulate the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids on their 25th anniversary. It's so exciting that you've reached this landmark moment. Um, we're very pleased at Bloomberg to be part of that with you and to support the work. Um, CTFK has been our advocacy partner on this journey, um, and it's been wonderful to collaborate every step of the way. I want to also call out the legal, the legal aspects of the CTFK work, what a really fantastic legal team that I think many countries have taken advantage of and really appreciated, um, and just so much um, partnership over these years. So it's been great. And again, enormous congratulations to the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Thank you, Kelly, for being with us today. Bloomberg Philanthropy support has been important to sustaining the global fight in tobacco control. So thank you for that. Now I'd like to invite our other speakers to come back and join us live so we can uh, take some questions from the audience. Our first question goes to you, Dr. Henning. Um, given the investment of um, the F Bloomberg Philanthropies in tobacco control, how do we get more donors interested in tobacco control so that there is an expanded commitment? 
Yeah, we, we really um, take that question to heart at Bloomberg and, and, and want very much to promote the idea that this is a, a very good investment for other uh, organizations, for foundations, for governments. We've worked a bit with Norway on this topic, and I think the Norwegian government's really stepped up, the UK government as well. We collaborate with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who've made some very important contributions um, in this area as well. But there's a lot more work to do, Yolanda. So I think um, part of it is getting the word out, getting that word out that this is not an old issue. It's a very timely and important current issue and that foundations and others should really be looking at it carefully. A number of you mentioned sort of new um, products that are coming onto the market and specifically e-cigarettes. Um, I'll turn this question over to you, um, Mr. Chadre to just talk about what Bangladesh is considering doing in regulating um, these products. H how are you, how is the government moving forward? E-cigarettes is um, something that we are very well aware of, you know, and I think that there is a, there is a strategy in this. I think that that's a, a market that they're looking for. They're trying to entice the young generation. So we are trying, I think uh, one of the proposals we have on the table when we're discussing the budget, is that there should be a complete uh, ban on e-cigarettes as the Honorable Health Minister in India was also talking about it. I think the point that Kelly uh, makes is uh, absolutely right. You know, they are extremely innovative. Uh, they're extremely uh, nimble. You know, when I say they, I'm referring to the tobacco industry. And uh, we really need to outsmart them. We have to outthink them. And I think that's where the real challenge is, trying to anticipate what the next move is. So I certainly see uh, e-cigarettes as being, you know, they're in their range uh, of products that they're going to bring in more and more, especially because I think now they are targeting the younger generation. And, uh, you know, so we have to we have to make sure that we don't drop our guard. You know, we are fighting tobacco, but we are also at the same time, we have to keep an eye on how the uh, the e-cigarettes uh, issue is coming up. I think I think that is very important and it's going to be one of the new items uh, in the future. So this is going to be an ongoing battle. You know, I mean, we maybe neutralize them in one area and then they'll be innovative and come up with uh, something new in another. So we really have to be watchful. And that's why I said right at the beginning, it's it's a marathon rather than a sprint. And and it's it's all, you know, different type of races brought together. So we also need to be nimble. We also need to be able to adjust our strategy and, and move quickly. And I think that's where the, the you know, the partnership, the coalition, um, of, uh, of those of us who believe in public health uh, come into play. And I think the other big opportunity is, you know, I mean, COVID tragic and absolutely uh, tragic and unfortunate uh, it is. But then it is, I think, uh, focused on the importance of public health. You know, I mean, and public health is about prevention. And with tobacco also, you're talking about prevention. So how can we use uh, COVID? Uh, to drive home that message of prevention. Um, and I think so, you know, we, we, we need to be up with the times and we need to constantly recalibrate our focus. We need to uh, redefine, uh, reword our messages uh, and be very aware of what's going on, which is why this global uh, solidarity is so very important because what may not be uh, evident in Bangladesh today is perhaps evident in some other country and it's going to be where Bangladesh will be tomorrow. So I think we need to, in fact, intensify this collaboration even more as we go forward. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning COVID. Um, it's a question that came up as well in, uh, from the audience. Um, Peter, I'll ask you, Brazil, like many countries, has been struggling with how to manage um, the COVID pandemic. Can you speak to how um, tobacco control, what are the, the challenges um, to keep tobacco control front and center as you're also simultaneously grappling with all of the problems associated with the pandemic? Oh, thank you. I, I think that um, um, we are having a, a lots of, of uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge to address the tobacco pandemic during the COVID pandemic, uh, especially because the, the public health priority shifts to uh, another area. And in some way, the tobacco industry has also used the COVID pandemic and uh, uh, their advantage uh, from the point of view that they are promoting their uh, corporate uh, uh, social responsibility. 
by donating alcohol and uh, ventilators and, uh, and, uh, and other devices. So uh, with a, a very little effort, they are just bringing their um, presence into this uh, uh, fight against the COVID and uh, um, uh, taking advantage of the COVID in order to, um, uh, to, to force, let's say, the legalization of uh, electronic uh, nicotine delivery systems, uh, the e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products and so on and so forth. So um, um, apart from that, they are just uh, um, uh, financing uh, uh, studies that have uh, strong bias in regard to the use of tobacco um, as, a, as a means to uh, in some way deal with, with COVID. And uh, they are even uh, uh, just uh, promoting or just studying vaccines, the idea of bringing tobacco as a component of vaccines. So uh, there is a big challenge. Uh, uh, the government uh, is now there. There are there is a, a, um, a project of, uh, of law a discussion about having earmarked taxes on tobacco products and other risk products uh, in order to uh, be able to uh, uh, revert back with those funds to uh, address the COVID uh, pandemic. Anyway, it's always a challenge and this is um, uh, like uh, it was already said, it's on top of what we already have to do in terms of tobacco control in Brazil. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask um, uh, uh, Pankaj Chaturvedi and also Lilia Olafir to talk a little bit about um, the fact of the cu current work in your countries. Both of your countries are now in the midst of trying to amend tobacco control laws to address gaps, uh, remaining gaps. Um, but recently, the tobacco industry has been pretty aggressive in uh, its propaganda, specifically um, criticizing any international interference specifically naming both Bloomberg Philanthropies as well as CTFK. So I'll start with you, Dr. Chateverdi. What do you think um, the response should be? So thank you, Yolanda, for bringing this uh, very important uh, issue. And that uh, industry has uh, gone into the tactics of discrediting tobacco control advocates and the international NGOs who are supporting the national tobacco control advocates. This has been a challenge and we are struggling with it. And unfortunately, tobacco industry has succeeded in it. And many national, uh, uh, national governments uh, consider it as a interference by international NGOs in the national policy making and also tobacco control effort, which is evidently pro-public health. So it is a sad state of affairs, but uh, many tobacco control advocates are suffering because of this change uh, in the statement and belief in the national governments about international collaboration in tobacco control. Now coming to how we are dealing with it, uh, basically in India, uh, two years uh, we suffered because of this change in the stand and the branding of international agencies as something which are trying to destabilize the Indian economy. But now slowly uh, with the political support that we have, our prime minister in 2014, he made a strong uh, appeal to the society that uh, the tobacco is destroying the families and uh, tobacco control is the need of the hour to save people from this epidemic. Our health minister has already spoken about it. Now, what happens that uh, because, as I told you, that tobacco control is a political effort, no amount of uh, commitment from the political leadership can always uh, overcome the barriers and hurdles posed by the tobacco industry tobacco lobby and uh, they always uh, put farmers like we say about tobacco victims they always put farmers uh, as the front uh, face of the tobacco industry and whenever we talk about tobacco control they say that what about those millions of the farmers and their families uh, which are uh, going to be deprived because of tobacco control effort and we always say 
that farmers are as much victims of tobacco industry as are the users of uh, tobacco. The reason is that here we are trying to take people away from tobacco and the farmers live 24 seven, their families live 24 seven with the tobacco. They have green tobacco sickness. They are destroying their own economy where they're living because of the soil depletion, because of the environmental degradation, because of deforestation, because of the food scarcity. There is a loss of feed for the cattle because the whole forest is being deforested because of tobacco. So there are issues with the farmers as well. So we have realized that the tobacco industry is trying to create newer agendas, newer ways to belittle the effort and dilute the effort, but we have not given up international collaboration as uh, Sabir Chaudhary ji said that it is important. The support from the international community is important and COTPA amendment is on card. Perhaps we will be able to overcome that barrier uh, by tobacco industry for amendment of COTPA. Lilia, any reactions from you? Thank you. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. The closer we get to getting the policy win and, and very big win that we've been working very long time and also no win that we already have recent successes on tobacco taxation. This makes the industry even more eager to invest more in the discrediting campaigns. And it's very unfortunate that some of the media outlets becoming the victims of, of that. At the same time, um, the very important strategy for us is to have a very good relationship with policy champions and with our partners in civil society. Uh, having media watchdogs that are there and able to help us by just simply showing how manipulative the arguments that are used by the tobacco industry, it just takes the simple logic and simple argumentation and every journalist can do that. They are very skilled in showing how the industry manipulates and how they make a case of something that is not existing because the industry very often says that uh, tobacco control is not effective, that it's harmful and that people uh, in Ukraine that they don't support it. But we have every, um, we have the counter arguments and we know that more than 85 of Ukrainians support tobacco control measures and not just uh, they don't just support it in theory, but they support it in practice. We have the data to support it. And policy champions in Ukraine know that this fight isn't easy. And they also know that it's right and that they are on a good side. Because if the industry criticizes them, this is a very good indicator that we are as close to the victory as we can be. So it's rather a sign for us that we are on the right path, because the closer we get, the more angry the industry gets. So uh, we use this sign to build uh, on this momentum and as well to keep the partnership with anti-corruption organizations and with civil society in Ukraine who are there to support public health, not the tobacco industry. Thank you, Lilia. Just quickly, Kelly, one last question for you, which is how far are we from the end game? Oh, Yolanda, I, 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 I hope we're not too far from the end game, but um, we just have to, we just have to keep our eye on what works and uh, we have to really push the policies forward that really are going to reduce prevalence, reduce tobacco use. And I think we'll get there, but uh, I, I think it's one step at a time. So we got to, we have to keep on, we have to keep on keeping on. That's what I would say. Persistence is key. And so has been your support and the support of the philanthropy. I wanna thank everyone for participating today and thank our audience for submitting such incredible questions. Um, and it's a great way to reflect on the campaign's work over the past 25 years and to consider what's possible in the next 25 years. Um, as we close, I wanna thank everyone who supports our work, our partners, our funders, donors, staff, and board of directors. Our success over the past 25 years is possible because of you. To learn more about our work around the world, please visit the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids website. And if you would like to contribute to our work in recognition of our 25th anniversary, we encourage you to do so by donating at tfk.org backslash donate. Together, we can create a more equitable, just, and healthier future for us all. Thank you again for joining. Stay tuned for more 25th anniversary events as we continue to take on the toughest fights.